Well, this is an important day in ensuring our people are safer and fighting crime all over this city. I'm proud to sign laws that are going to save lives and improve the quality of life for New Yorkers. And the most important thing we're focused on today is stemming the tide of K2 in our communities. We're here today thanks to the leadership and dedication of the lead sponsor of this legislation, Council Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito, and her fellow sponsors, Councilmember Ruben Wills and Councilmember Dan Garodnik. I want to thank them all for their leadership. They've been dogged in ensuring that we address this issue and address it quickly. I want to thank uh, so many others who are with us. You'll be hearing from a number of them in a moment, but I want to also thank our Health Commissioner, Dr. Mary Bassett, our NYPD Chief of Department, Jimmy O'Neill. I want to thank uh, Assistant Deputy Commissioner for the Civil Enforcement Unit of the NYPD, Robert Messner. I want to thank, of course, the Commanding Officer here of the 25 Precinct, Deputy Inspector Thomas Harnish. I want to thank Deputy Commissioner John Miller uh, for Counterterrorism and Intelligence, and uh, Sheriff Joseph Facito of the Department of Finance. So thank you to all and to our friends at the Mayor's Office of uh, Criminal Justice. Everyone together worked on addressing the K-2 issue quickly and energetically. Let's be clear, K-2 is a poison. It is a poison that threatens public safety and public health. It has taken a toll on too many New Yorkers and too many communities already. It's something we haven't seen the likes of in the past. And it was crucial before this trend got any worse to act decisively. So we're getting K2 off of our streets and out of the hands of New Yorkers before it causes more harm to our city. East Harlem has sadly seen the worst of this situation. The 2-5 precinct covers East 125th Street, which has really been hit hard by the plague of K2. And the officers in this precinct have been on the front line of this battle, and they've done an extraordinary job fighting this new menace. We've also had tremendous support from local residents who wanted to be part of the solution and worked hand-in-hand -hand with the NYPD to turn the tide. Too many families watched as uh, victims were afflicted by this drug. And they saw the horrible impact it was making in their lives. They saw the ambulances coming to pick people up. And obviously, the residents realized quickly this was something new and dangerous, and it needed a vigorous response. So we've had a great partnership with community residents in addressing this issue. We're involved already in aggressive and targeted enforcement. Since July, the city has conducted five multi-agency inspection operations, seizing over 10,000 packages of K2 from sellers. And we've used our nuisance abatement laws against seven stores. So we've used the tools that we had. And on top of that, a tremendous operation last month, the NYPD uh, Intelligence Unit working directly with the DEA to dismantle a citywide distribution ring. They seized $17.5 million worth of K2 and uh, the ingredients and the paraphernalia used uh, related to K2. And it led to indictment of 10 individuals. So there's been a very vigorous set of actions taken, but we knew we needed stronger laws to do more. So today we take the next step. These laws do not punish the individuals that are held hostage and held in the grip of this toxic drug. We understand that some of the people who use this drug are amongst the most vulnerable in our city and often include those who are dealing with mental health issues already. So the law doesn't focus on uh, attacking the victim. It focuses on criminalizing the process that brings this poison into people's hands. In the 60 days when this law takes effect, if you manufacture K2, if you possess K2 with the intent to sell it, or if you sell K2, you are now going to come up against the greatest police force in the world that's now going to be empowered by these new laws to act more aggressively. Selling K2 will be a misdemeanor punishable by up to one year in prison and a possible fine of $5,000 as well as civil penalties of up to $50,000. And laws further make the sale a cause to suspend or revoke a business's license to sell cigarettes. So, this law will give us an additional power to go at the economic core of a lot of businesses if they, in fact, engage in this heinous action. 
threatens the ability of many of these stores to stay open. If they engage in selling K2, we will go at their livelihood and we will shut them down. Finally, the legislation allows sealing and closing orders to be issued against stores that repeatedly sell K2. So very aggressive measures to deal with the economic realities behind K2. These laws together send a clear message to anyone who sells this poison. We will find you and we will stop you. And our message to anyone who uses the drug and needs help is we are here to help you. Help is available, treatment is available, so people can get out of the clutches of this awful drug. It's an important day today, but we know it is a beginning. There will be a lot of work to implement these laws and a lot of our ongoing efforts to educate New Yorkers about the risks and to get people who need treatment to the treatment they deserve. We're doing this because it's the right thing to do, and we're also doing it out of our deep respect for community residents who have had to deal with this scourge in their neighborhoods. One of them I want to mention, Ephraim Boone, who's here today. Ephraim, where are you? Stand up for a moment so everyone can see you. I want to thank Ephraim, who's been a great community activist. He's seen the horrors of K2 in his community. He's literally seen them right outside his door. And he stood up and worked with the police and with uh, community leaders to make a change. And I want to just give you a simple quote that Ephraim said, which uh, is really encouraging because Ephraim, you saw this scourge develop and you saw the intensity of the response. As you said, quote, now, every time I turn around, the police run in and bust a store again. When people see that, that's a sign that the city is working. Everyone's working together. These bills are change. It will send a strong message, and that's what we need. So Ephraim, we thank you for being at the front line fighting this menace, and we're going to help you and help the police to get the job done and to end this scourge. Let me say a few words in Spanish. Las tres leyes que firmo hoy son muy importantes para combatir la producción y venta de drogas sintéticas en la ciudad. Las drogas sintéticas son un veneno, veneno. Al criminalizar la producción y venta de estas drogas, protegeremos las vidas de muchas personas y la calidad de vida de, de nuestras comunidades. With that, I want to bring forward the speaker. She's been uh, an extraordinary uh, voice and leader in this effort, and she really brought to all of our attention the depth of the problem based on what she was seeing in her district and the fact that we had to uh, add, add to the tools that we needed to fight this scourge. The working group that we put together to address issues in East Harlem quickly identified the need for additional legal strength that would add to the work of the NYPD and the Department of Consumer Affairs and the Department of Health. I want to thank the speaker for her leadership and for her commitment to addressing this issue in her district, but also in all five boroughs. Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito. <laughs> Well, buenas tardes, good afternoon to everyone, and in particular, thank you so much, Mr. Mayor, for holding this press conference here. Uh, you've mentioned a lot of those that are representing. I know there's a lot of community leaders here. I see representatives from our co local community board, Community Board 11. I see our district leader, John Ruiz, here. This is of concern to many of us, and that is why you have such an active uh, presence here of our community leaders. So having this press conference here is an affirmation of all the work um, that we've been struggling with for some time. And personally, you have been literally hands-on when we brought this concern about what was happening on 125th Street to you. Uh, not only that you convened this task force, but you personally attended those meetings. Uh, so your interest in really helping us uh, was present from the beginning, and now we are here um, in the culmination of, of this uh, bill signing. So I want to thank you personally for that. So today we're taking uh, another step in moving improving the quality of life in neighborhoods all across New York City by enacting strong laws to combat the spread of K2. While K2 is sold as a synthetic alternative to marijuana, we've seen time and again that it is in fact a very dangerous and unpredictable drug. It is a poison. Those in search of a cheap and legal substitute to marijuana are led to believe that the drug has similar effects, but the effects of K2 can be life-threatening. The City Council has led the charge to get K2 off the shelves and away from our most vulnerable citizens. 
As the council member representing El Barrio East Harlem, this has been an issue of great personal importance to me, with 125th Street and Lexington Avenue being the epicenter of this problem. I also want to thank the leadership of my colleagues, Council Member Wills, who has been dealing with this issue for a couple of years, and uh, also Council Member Gorodnik, and we're here with Council Member Vanessa Gibson as well. Today we're taking a very real step with these laws, but the success of our efforts is rooted in a collaborative process between the Council, the Administration, the NYPD, and other city agencies. That's why even before today's new laws take effect, we've been taking steps to get K2 out of this very neighborhood with the help of Commanding Officer uh, Deputy Inspector Tom Harnish and the 125th Street Task Force, which my office convened in response to a host of quality of life issues along that corridor, including the use of K2. Some additional members of that task force are here today, and the mayor just uh, introduced him, including Ephraim Boone and J.J. Williams, who live right in the 125th Street area and dealt with the effects of K2 every single day. They were strong advocates for their neighborhood and great partners as we developed the strategies we've employed to combat this drug. We're also happy to be joined by representatives from the BRC Men's Shelter, Hope Community, and as I mentioned, Community Board 11. I also want to give a special thanks to my district office and my Deputy Chief of Staff, Diana Ayala, who is here, um, that my district office has been at the forefront of this issue. With the power of these new laws, these same partners can take even more action to stop the spread of this dangerous substance. Let me be clear, though, that these laws are focused on getting K2 off our streets and not criminalizing users of it. To that end, these laws will deal with the stores that distribute and sell K2, not stigmatize or punish the vulnerable populations that are stat to statistically likely to try the drug. These are smart laws that were created while considering and learning from the realities we've observed about drug policy in our city. And these laws are going to be effective in protecting New Yorkers from one of the more dangerous substances that has unfortunately found its way onto our streets. So again, I want to thank all my colleagues in the council. I want to thank Mayor de Blasio, Commissioner Bratton, Commissioner Menon, uh, and all the city agencies who have worked with us to address this issue, Commissioner Bassett as well. Um, and I'll say a few words in Spanish. Hoy estamos dando otro paso en la mejora de la calidad de vida en barrios a través de la ciudad de Nueva York mediante la promulgación de leyes estrictas para combatir la propagación del K2. Mientras que K2 se vende como una alternativa sintética a la marihuana, que hemos visto repetidamente que es en realidad una droga muy peligrosa e impredecible. Aquellos en busca de un sustituto barato y legal a la marihuana son llevados a creer que la droga tiene efectos similares, pero los efectos de K2 pueden ser potencialmente mortales. Como miembro del consejo que representa el barrio, este ha sido un tema de gran importancia personal y por eso estamos aquí para que el alcalde firme estos tres proyectos de ley. Estas leyes se enfocan en eliminar K2 de nuestras calles y no en criminalizar a los usuarios. Y eso es bien importante recalcar. Me gustaría agradecer a mis colegas en el Consejo Municipal, al alcalde de Blasio, al comisionado Bratton, al comisionado, la comisionada Menen y a todas las agencias que están aquí eh, eh, presentes hoy. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you, Speaker. Now it's my honor to bring forward our police commissioner. Uh, as I said, we have a a constant dialogue going on at City Hall on how we can adjust to any changes we see and the discussions in the East Harlem Task Force led to discussions that uh, Commissioner Bratton and I have every week and we immediately determined the need for stronger laws. We had uh, tremendous leadership in the City Council to get it done. So this is absolutely a, a group effort and a speedy group effort. I want to thank you, Commissioner, for your leadership. Commissioner Bill Bratton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Echoing the mayor's comment about speed, I've uh, been in the business a long time, 45 years this year, and this is one of the few times where I've actually seen government come together so quickly around an identified issue. All levels of government, at the federal level, here at the city, and when this issue first began surfacing, the prevalence of hospital admissions from this new type of drug that we knew very little about, that the speaker was certainly seeing it more prevalent in her district than just about any place else in the city. 
federal government was starting to see it around other areas of the country, including uh, Washington, D.C., Miami, that there was a quick coalescing about what can we do, what tools do we have to deal with it. At the federal level, they had significant tools through the DEA, and we immediately engaged with them, with the uh, Southern District, to work with them on the larger case that the mayor mentioned that you covered earlier this summer, where we recovered over two and a half million packets of this. We were able to break up the uh, distribution network, and we were also able to uh, seize the properties where they were creating these uh, packages here in New York. At the same time, and simultaneously, the city was moving together in a very collaborative way, health and hospitals, the various commissioners who were here, working with the neighborhood groups and the creation of the task force that the mayor mentioned to identify what could we do better at the city government level, even as the feds were assisting us at their level. From that came the series of laws, and I want to applaud the council for the quick both creation of the laws but passage, because they will give us, the police, additional tools to work with, tools to deal with particularly the sale of this uh, uh, particular drug, and a drug that uh, has extraordinary, extraordinarily harmful capabilities. One of the dangers of K2 is p different people react very differently to it. And part of the issue of K2 is no two packets are exactly alike in terms of the content, because the way it is prepared, the way it is created, the way they're constantly changing the formula, you never quite know what dose you're getting or what dose of what particular package of chemicals. And we have seen extraordinary issues over the summer uh, of how people react to this, and usually in a very negative way. We have also created uh, up in the area most significantly affected by this in that 125th Street, Lexington corridor, a task force that's reporting out of this precinct, 30 somewhat officers, a lieutenant, five sergeants, 30 officers, 24-hour day of coverage specifically in that area to address not only the K2 problem, but the many other related areas of uh, concern in that area. Additionally, in the subway stations in that location, we have additional patrols. So what you are, uh, being, what's being reported on today is the results of the collaborative effort, federal, local, but the good news is that we've been very successful, I think, in stopping what could have been a tidal wave. But we're not stopping there. We are effectively adding to our ability to build up our bulwark against it basically coming back at us again. So the laws we get to work with, the additional resources the inspector at this uh, precinct has to work with, as well as some of the additional attention in the several other precincts that are experiencing this problem, we have the ability to really uh, collaboratively as a government really stop what it was shaping up to be an incredible health hazard. Good news is since the month of June and July when the highest number of admissions from overdoses began to be experienced by the hospitals, uh, those admissions are down about 21 percent. Also, the most recent raids that we've conducted, we're finding minimal amounts of this uh, drug in those bodegas. I think the ones we conducted last week, they found six or seven packets in one location versus the hundreds and thousands we were finding back in June and July. So great progress, great progress with community involvement, community leadership. Great progress with the leadership at the local uh, uh, political level. Great progress at the city level uh, with the mayor. And great progress with our colleagues at the federal government. Mm -hmm. Government uh, uh, working at its best collaboratively. And uh, I think we, being quite frankly, I think we really averted a major public health crisis. It was bad enough what we're experiencing, but it could have been a lot worse. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Amen. Thank you very much, Commissioner. In addition to NYPD, we've had great leadership from other city agencies and Department of Consumer Affairs has used all of its regulatory power to send a very clear message to store owners that the sale of K2 will not be tolerated. And again, we're going to use a lot of the tools at our disposal plus the new tools that these laws will give us to make sure there are very, very serious economic consequences for any store owner that breaks the law and endangers people through the sale of this drug. We're also going to have a strong public education campaign uh, to make sure that the store owners understand the consequences here, both the human consequences and uh, the ramifications of being involved with this drug. Leading that effort is our Commissioner for the Department of Consumer Affairs, Julie Menon.
Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. And I really want to thank the mayor and their speaker for their aggressive and very strong leadership on this issue that has really given the various city agencies you see here today additional powers. DCA is proud to have played a key role in the city's multi-agency response to combat K2. The drug, as you heard the mayor and speaker talk about, have been plaguing so many neighborhoods across New York City and has been sold in bodegas and other stores which DCA licenses. Specifically, we license over 9,000 uh, such establishments across the city. And what these um, new laws do in terms of DCA's jurisdiction is a new law imposes a mandatory suspension of a cigarette retail dealer's license for 30 days for the first violation and mandatory revocation for the second violation. This really has very key economic consequences because for so many establishments, they derive the majority of their revenue from the sale of cigarettes. We've also joined the multi-agency response. As the mayor has said, we've seized, along with NYPD and the sheriff's office, over 10,000 packets of K2. We've issued violations for violations of the state's agriculture and market laws. And we've also issued violations um, for the city's consumer protection law for claims that the product is potpourri, incense, the use of cartoon characters, all of which are patently false claims. Lastly, I just want to mention, as the mayor said, we are working very closely with the health department to uh, disseminate a public awareness campaign. It's multimedia. You'll see it over the course of the next couple weeks. It's aimed at three populations, users, potential users, and retailers. And lastly, we are going to be holding a conference along with Health and MockJ, a citywide summit on K2 on November 16th at Brooklyn Law School. So once again, I really want to thank the council and the mayor for giving us these enhanced tools that will help us to continue our efforts to crack down on K2. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I'd like to hear from two of our colleagues from the city council who were co-sponsors of this legislation and played an important role in getting it passed. Council member Reuben Wills. Uh, the K2 that once flowed freely from stores to streets, traffickers could thank you, speaker. <laughs> traffickers could market their products to children by using catchy names and glossy packaging to captivate them. Manufacturers could successfully sidestep our state's laws by constantly churning out chemical compounds that couldn't be cataloged quickly enough. And our city's law enforcement and civilian agencies lacked the power to effectively deter the sale of these hazardous substances. With the signing of these bills, we will begin to choke off the K2 pipeline by imposing severe penalties on the operators of known synthetic marijuana distribution centers. Our thoughtful yet forceful response to this public health crisis is carefully designed not to burden individual users. I want to thank the leadership of the mayor, uh, Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito, Council Members uh, Corey Johnson, Vanessa Gibson, and Daniel Grodnick. And I do also want to take a quick 30 seconds to thank my staff um, who were with us um, throughout this. Uh, my Chief of Staff, Leslie Ann Patterson, India Sneed, my former uh, Director of uh, Leg uh, Legislative Affairs, my current Director, Brandon Clark, and my Director of Community Liaisons, uh, Jahai Rose. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. Thank, thank you, you for the Commissioners. Thank you. Finally, I want us to hear from the Chair of the Public Safety Committee in the City Council. We work on, we work with on so many of these issues. Council Member Vanessa Gibson. You guys didn't clap for me? No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure and honor to stand with all of my colleagues, with the mayor, police commissioner, the speaker of the city council, all of our commissioners, and all of you. We are truly standing here collectively recognizing the fact that K2 has erupted in our communities. It tears at the heart and soul of our communities, the public health and public safety of all New Yorkers. Let's be clear that the climate and the environment that we set, the tone we set as a council, as a city, is profound in recognizing that we're going after manufacturers and distributors of this dangerous product. The fact that it has an attractive wrapper, it's inexpensive, it's called K2, AK-47, synthetic cannabinoids, Scooby snacks, and the like. The fact that 
it is all too common in our local grocery stores and bodegas is unacceptable. We are being extremely aggressive in our approach and not victimizing users, potential users, but recognizing that we must stop this in its tracks. Today's legislation and signing of this legislation is our commitment as a public servants that we are recognizing that we must treat this as a public health and public safety crisis. We are embarking on a public service campaign where we are educating New Yorkers on the dangers of K2. The fact that there have been thousands of hospitalizations across our city of individuals who are using this. The fact that we know that there are underlying causes and roots of drug users using drugs in the first place. And so we will deal with that as we continue to work. But we must recognize that the few bad apples will not make it bad for the entire communities in which we live in, work, and raise our children. And so I am thankful as the chair of public safety to stand here with all of my colleagues showing my commitment, making sure that these bills become law. We are declaring it a public nuisance. We are going to go after those that have a cigarette retail license. If you want to do business in this city and you want to work with us, and be a part of the solution and not the problem, then we need you to stop selling K2 to our residents in this city. So I am thankful to be here. This is a collective process. The journey does not stop today. We have a lot of work we will continue to do. And thank you to the leadership of Mayor Bill de Blasio, of all of our commissioners, Dr. Bassett, Commissioner Menon, Police Commissioner Bratton. Thank you to the Speaker of the City Council, Melissa Mark Viverito, not only recognizing this right here in her community, but recognizing that we must be aggressive in our approach. Thank you to my colleagues, Council Members Corey Johnson, Dan Garotnik, Ruben Wills, Ralph Espinal, who chairs Consumer Affairs. We come together with common, common priorities and common principles and values that we are going to protect the public health and the public safety of every New Yorker. So thank you all for being here. East Harlem, thank you for standing up with many sit down. Continue to stand up. Continue to fight for our community's safety and well-being. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take questions on uh, the legislation and, and on fighting K2 and then on other police matters, then we'll take off-topic questions. Yes. Uh, Mr. Mayor, a few mi minutes before you started this press conference, uh, Governor Cuomo set up, uh, announced a PSA campaign focusing on this specifically and also uh, prescription drug abuse. Is it the announcement also coordinated with your office? Or? I think it's, I, I just heard about it now, I think it's a great initiative. So it wasn't coordinated as far as I know, but I think it's certainly kindred and welcome. Is, is it a problem that it wasn't? Like, Again, I think it no contributes, problem. it contributes to the same goal. So I think it's good. Could what you else? Deputy Commissioner Miller, a question. Indeed. Calling me short? Yes, I am. Okay. <laughs> yes, Mary. Commissioner, we've been reporting on this for several months, and there were concerns raised last year, raids around the country with the money, where it was going, millions that were being wired overseas. Uh, last week, the DEA did raids and in mail facilities and acknowledged that the money was often going to countries of concern in the Middle East. Are you concerned the K2 sales and the other synthetic cannabinoid sales are financing terrorism? Yes, we're concerned with the question, but we don't know the answer. Uh, one of the origins of this case within the Intelligence Bureau uh, of the NYPD stemmed from uh, the idea that that hundreds of millions of dollars associated with K2 was traveling out of the United States um, to a number of countries, but largely uh, among them Yemen. And when you look at the situation in Yemen between the Houthi rebels, uh, Al-Qaeda of the Arabian Peninsula, um, and other factors there, you would have to ask, uh, where's the money going and what's it going to finance? And that is not part of the narcotics conspiracy case that was brought here in the Southern District of New York, but it is one of the intelligence gaps surrounding this issue. Okay, any first again, K2 questions first, then we'll do other policing questions, then we'll sign the bill, then we'll come back and do off topic. So people could be arrested or uh, stores, bodega owners that are selling it if 
but how much do they need to have for you to consider they are selling it? We know with marijuana, it's the 25 grams or less. If you have that, you're not considered to be selling it. Somebody has, what, five packets, 20 packets, 500 packets, what's... Okay, who wants to speak to the specifics of the, the standard? Who's got it? Rob Messner. Rob, come on up. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you, yourself, if you don't mind. I'm Assistant Deputy Commissioner Rob Messner of the NYPD Civil Enforcement Unit. So the uh, statute, the new law, uh, criminalizes K2 in any amount, but it also contains a presumption that if a person possesses nine packages of K2, that that presumption says they're possessing it with intent to sell. Okay. Other questions? Questions on K2? Yeah, I'll just I, uh, Yes, sir. Commissioner Bratton or Commissioner Miller, uh, there was concern, and there was a lot of reports about a lot of the K2 is originating in China, and the labs there, uh, uh, I don't know how organized it is. Uh, what is. What is your sense of it now? Is, is China a major source of the drug, or you see it here? China has been and continues to be the principal source of the chemicals that are used in the creation of K2. It's a combination of chemicals that are mixed in all types of different formulas, usually trying to stay one step ahead of existing laws by changing the makeup. They basically step outside the scope of the law. That uh, the feds are able to address that with their, their tools. Uh, and then the manufacture of the K2 is usually done here in the United States, where it's sprayed on leaves that look like marijuana, thus the name synthetic marijuana. But the uh, source, that, as far as I know, the only source of the chemicals that are used in this is China. John, unless you have more recent intelligence than I oh, do yeah. on that. That's correct. Okay. All right. Yes. Mayor de Blasio, has the city been able to determine how many deaths, if any, have been attributed to K2? Let's see if our health commissioner will take that. Mary Bassett. There's been one substantiated death attributed to K2 in the city. Of course, across the nation, there have been more deaths reported. Uh, and we do have cases of people ending up in the intensive care unit. So there should be no question that this is dangerous stuff and that it has untoward health consequences, but so far, just one death. Are you tracking it? We are. We track uh, emergency department visits, uh, which are our principal way of identifying the, um, the occurrence and use of K2 in the city. It's what enabled us to identify this neighborhood as a place where there was a great deal of K2 originating because of emergency department visits. And it's what we're going to use going forward to uh, see how well we do in removing this from our streets and reducing emergency department visits. One last thing on that. Could you, have, by any chance, do you have the number of ER visits available? Sure. We can make those available. They've been made available in various health inert alerts, which we use to uh, alert the health care community that this is a problem. We've listed, we've uh, released three of those, and those are all publicly available. I can follow. How difficult is it when people go in? Because I understand when they go in, if they're hallucinating or other issues, that some hospitals may not be up on, oh, this is an episode of K2 use. How difficult is it when you take all of these EMS loads of folks to the hospitals and they're using K2 and can't figure out what's going on with them? You're right that this can be extremely variable in its presentation, as numbers of the speaker, uh, Commissioner Bratton, have mentioned. The composition of this product is very variable. Uh, you know, people, when they hear the word synthetic marijuana, I think they have an image of somebody in a white lab coat in a lab making something up according to a uh, a, uh, a protocol. Uh, it's not like that. The thing you should think of is somebody in a t-shirt in a warehouse hosing down leaves with some concoction that's made up of chemicals that they bought on the internet that are called synthetic cannabinoids. So the symptoms can be very variable uh, from nausea, vomiting, lethargy, which is now quite common, uh, to agitation, hallucinations. People actually aren't often violent. Uh, and that's why we alert health care providers with our health alerts uh, that we send out to 25,000 email addresses so that they'll think of this when people come into the hospital and ask the question. There's no specific antidote. We have to treat people symptomatically, uh, but we do want the health care provider community to be aware of it so that they identify it and they report it to us and they treat the patient. Go ahead. Uh, 
up to you, sure. Mr. Miller. Just um, one other thing that we've been tracking is um, in a snapshot that was taken 10 days after the K-2 takedown uh, that involved Rob Messner's people and the nuisance abatement, the seizure of, of all the material in the federal case, uh, we saw a 28 percent decline in K-2-related emergency room visits. So what we are hoping is armed with this law and the ability to continue enforcement on the retail level of the sales network that we can continue that decline. There is a, a separate answer to your question, which is there are deaths that may be categorized by the medical examiner as resulting from K2, but we're seeing other deaths that will be categorized as other things. In late July, I was on the Hudson River at Pier 46 when a man smoked K2, jumped in the river, and, and drowned. He was recovered a short time later. The cause of death there will be drowning, mm -hmm. but K2 is a, a significant contributing factor. This weekend, just up the street, we had a woman found dead. We interviewed the man who was with her. He said they spent the night drinking and smoking K2. Uh, we're waiting on the cause of death there, but you're going to have to understand that will be a contributing factor. So the numbers may be deceiving about the level of seriousness of the problem. Okay. On this topic, yes? Um, with some of the youth, they think they're smoking marijuana, but they seem to have K2 symptoms. To what extent is this being sprayed on marijuana to give it an extra kick to, to that extent? Is that Mary? Do you want to speak I, to I that? I actually don't know the or answer PD? to that question. Uh, you, are you, uh, you're asking whether we're, there's sort of boosted marijuana out there, and I'm, I'm, I don't know. Uh, I don't think any of us back here have seen it. Uh, the, the problem with K2 is that it's cheap. It's been too available. And uh, it, uh, that's why the, the main public health approach to it is to, is to reduce the availability, get it off the streets. And we know we can do that because we have been doing it. We've seen these declines citywide. Uh, but I don't know about boosting marijuana. Okay. Other questions on this? Rich? Mr. Mayor, uh, for you or maybe the police commissioner, how would you characterize those who continue to sell this product now that the uh, outcomes and the, the, the detrimental effects are, are well known? Yeah, I, look, it's absolutely unacceptable. It's immoral. Uh, anyone who sells this product is endangering other people's lives, and they're acting in a criminal manner, and we're going to get them. It's as simple as that. And, uh, you know, it's not, it's not something people can explain away. There's plenty of information now out there about how dangerous this is. And so any business that does this, we're going to go at them using criminal charges, but we're also going to go at them economically. Mayor, what kind of effect do you think K2 is having on this city's homeless population? Again, the information is limited because this is a new trend, but we have seen in this area, in East Harlem, a real negative impact on the homeless. And it's cheap and too available. Uh, and uh, too many people had other kinds of problems, started uh, reaching out to K2 and only made their lives much, much worse. And so, you know, we want to get this at the root. We want to get it early, as Commissioner Bratton said, before the situation got out of control. But the goal, as with everything we are doing in terms of homeless folks, is to try and figure out what will get them on the right path. So if these are folks who already are susceptible to a uh, drug habit, we want to get them the treatment to get them away from that kind of problem. Question. The state ban isn't as strong as a city. Are you hopeful that the state will follow the city's lead? Well, absolutely. We want the strongest tools available to law enforcement. So you know, we think what we have here is going to help us immensely, but the more the better. Yeah. Uh, a couple times today has been mentioned that 125th and Lex was the epicenter for this K2 epidemic. The folks who live and work in that area, I'm sure they want to know what made their neighborhood such a hotbed for K2. You know, I don't think we, again, this is a new phenomenon. I don't think we have all the analysis here. I think what we know, and thanks again largely to the leadership of Speaker Mark Fivrito, is we identified the problem and then put a series of actions into place very quickly to address it. And now these laws will give us many more tools. So uh, the bottom line is when we find a new issue or a new problem, it's our job to act quickly, and I think this will turn the tide. Yeah. I understand the fines against the businesses selling the K2, but what I found out of the story that the Daily News did was that a lot of people were buying it from their peers on the street out of plastic bags, just handing them what they call sticks. Um, and since the bus in the Bronx, the price it doubled on the street. 
And what would you do against, uh, regarding the people on the street selling? Let's, let's let our, who'd like to jump sure. in? Uh, Rob? Yeah, up there again. Uh, well, this new law does criminalize sale of K2 in any venue. It doesn't have to just be in a store. So someone who was selling K2 on the street would also be in violation of this law and would therefore be arrested and prosecuted. Simple and straightforward. <laughs> yes. I know that you're not targeting the people who use K2, but obviously if there was no demand, people wouldn't be selling it. Is there going to be an effort to convince people, some of them homeless, not to use K2? Absolutely. In terms of both public education campaigns in general, that will reach everyone. But also the outreach work the Department of Homeless Services does is explicitly to tell people about things that might be dangerous to their health and to encourage them to get the help they need, for example, drug treatment or mental health services. So uh, it's very much a part of what we do is to try and get people away from negative influences and to a better path. Okay, any other police-oriented questions? Go ahead. You mentioned that you had a lot of uh, help from the community in this effort. Um, I was wondering if there was a lot of contact, too, with the bodega owners, and how would you qualify the relationship with them? Okay. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Now that these new laws will be going into effect shortly, we are going to be reaching out to every bodega owner. As I mentioned, DCA licenses 9,000 establishments that sell cigarettes, and so we're going to be reaching out to the bodega community to talk to them. In addition, the public awareness campaign, as I mentioned, is targeted to sellers, to users, to potential users. One of the big messages we want to get across is that K2 is dangerous, that the claims are being made are fraudulent, it is being marketed as one thing, but it is really something entirely different. And so we really need to hammer home that message very, very clearly, and that's what our public awareness campaign will do. Okay. Please, Michael. Uh, I have a question for Commissioner Braddon. Um, uh, you're part of a national group of leading police officials and prosecutors who are preparing to say that the rate of mass incarceration in the country has uh, is now unsustainable and um, you're hoping to seek reforms to address that. I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, why now? Uh, was there a tipping point in your thinking that um, prompted you to take that position? There's nothing new about my thinking on this. Back in 1995, I talked about when we began to significantly increase the arrests in the city for both the serious crime that was afflicting the city, but also the quality of life that was a much bigger problem back then. I described it as a bell curve that to control behavior, to change behavior, you're going to have to control it. And New York City for 25 years had failed in its responsibility to control the behavior of its citizens to obey the law, serious and minor. We corrected that first with fare evasion in the subway, uh, basically uh, issues around uh, quality of life issues in the subway, then in the streets with the squeegee pests and many of the other uh, issues that were so troubling, prostitution, sale of narcotics in the streets. But we predicted there would be a bell curve and that bell curve has in fact happened. Uh, if you look back at 95, 96, that uh, Rikers had about 22,000 people a day on daily population. Rikers right now probably has almost as many corrections officers as does inmates, about 10,000. State prison, since we're the primary feeder of state prisons in this uh, uh, state, that 40% decline is primarily because of the reduced amount of crime and the reduced amount of arrests necessary to control that crime. So the national movement uh, here is something I'm very supportive of because we've been talking about it for 20 years, and this state has been leading the way, this state and city, for a number of years on that effort and uh, has been well ahead of the curve on understanding that you can't kind of arrest your way out of the problem. So I'm a strong advocate of arrest where appropriate, but uh, under the law we're given great tools to work with arrest, admonition, summons, citation, and that's the approach we've been taking and the approach we'll continue to take. Is decriminalizing some of those minor offenses a way toward reducing the incarceration rate? Well, certainly. We have seen that in terms of marijuana enforcement in this city, something that the mayor, the speaker, and myself have been uh, strongly engaged in over these last several years. Uh, the idea that uh, the possession of marijuana is such that we could deal with that without making an arrest. You smoke it in the street, still subject to arrest, but officers have the discretion to uh, basically do something other than arrest for dealing with that. So. 
again, this is not a new posture uh, in this city. It's been something that has been practiced going back to when I first came here 25 years ago, that we're using the range of tools. And so this issue here, uh, its strength is that it provides a range of tools to the police officers. It focuses on the core of the problem, those selling and making the drug, while at the same time still giving us tools to deal with those who use it, but abuse it in a way that it requires a police intervention.